Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it, for good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. He has had more impact on the world than all the teachers, scientists, emperors, generals, and admirals who ever lived, all put together. The Apostle John said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We have been promised that all we have to do is ask God in Jesus' name to help when we have done all we can, when we've come to the end of our strength and abilities, and we'll have that help. We only have to trust and have faith in his infinite goodness and mercy. 
loyal, you and Edith have known a great love, more than many have been permitted to know. That love will not end with the end of this life. We've been promised this is only a part of life and that a greater life, a greater glory awaits us. It awaits you together one day and all that is required is that you believe and tell God you put yourself in his hands. That's from a four page letter to a man named Loyal Davis from his son-in-law. Loyal, an avowed atheist, was dying of cancer and his son-in-law wrote him, demonstrating concern and calling Loyal to consider surrendering his soul to Jesus Christ before it was too late. Now, if I reveal the stationary letterhead and the signature to you, this will become clearer. The letter is written on White House stationery in the handwriting of a person named Ronnie, of course, known better to history as Ronald Wilson Reagan, the 40th president of the United States. Loyal Davis was the father of Reagan's wife, Nancy. Jesus Christ is the focal point of Reagan's letter. And Jesus Christ is very much the focal point of the letter to the Hebrews in our Bibles. This is a letter written to Jewish Christians. And if we had to summarize the themes of the letter in one sentence, the ESV study Bible does a great job. Here's what it says. Christ has accomplished final salvation, has brought the final word of God, and has become the final priest and the one atoning sacrifice to which the Old Testament pointed. As I mentioned last week, in the messages I'm preaching from Hebrews, we'll be walking alongside John Owen, a Christian pastor and theologian from 350 years ago, who penned perhaps the greatest and the most in-depth commentary on the book of Hebrews in existence. If you want to hear more about his life, you can watch my sermon introduction from last week. But in Owen's commentary, he examines each chapter of Hebrews for points of faith and doctrine that he then distills to a sentence or two, and then he expounds on those throughout the text. And as I said before, this isn't someone who's getting paid by the word. This isn't someone who just likes to hear himself talk. This is a guy who sees scriptures with a depth of like a seasoned jeweler looking at the gem. He's got the gimlet eye. So for example, from chapters four and five, Owen gleaned 85 and 72 points of doctrine respectively. That's a total of 157 points of doctrine that with his eyes he saw could be culled out of this scripture. Out of those 157, I will share five. Otherwise we'd be here a while. So let's get started. You've got the handout in front of you uh, from uh, the bulletin, and you can fill in the blanks as we go. That helps some people just track along with us. First point uh, that I want to bring you from Owen is derived from chapter 4, verse 9, where he says, There is a weekly sacred rest appointed for believers under the gospel. Now here Owen is referring to the Sabbath rest mentioned in that verse. Rest, you've probably heard that word over and over, chapters three, chapter four, chapter five, it says rest a lot. Sabbath is mentioned in your Bible 150-ish times. Interestingly, this is the last time, if you're reading the Bible consecutively, the way it's laid out, this is the last time you're gonna come across that word in the New Testament. But the Sabbath, as many of you know, is the setting aside of every seventh day to rest from work and uh, worldly requirements, to have the worship and the contemplation of God at the center of our attention and where God takes center stage. Now, human beings always find new and creative ways to rebel against God. We have this endless font of creativity, right? And one example of that was during the French Revolution. The guiding principles of the French Revolution were different than those uh, that were guiding the American Revolution, although they happened in close proximity chronologically. And one of the unfortunate goals of the French Revolution 
was a purging of religion, specifically Christianity, from the civic and public sphere. One historian, Sean Busick, put it, the French deified reason above not only experience, but also above religion and divine revelation. Indeed, some of you might not know this, they even transformed Notre Dame into a temple of reason and held pseudo-religious festivals in honor of this new deity. So part of the French Revolution's attempt to untether itself from Christianity took the form of establishing a new week. You heard that right. They're going to establish a new week. Ten days instead of seven days. And that foolishness lasted from 1793 until 1805 until even the most ardent secularists uh, and revolutionaries said, okay, uncle, this isn't working. And Busick concludes, reason unrestrained and unguided by history and experience proved unable to establish stable government or to secure liberty in France. Instead, it led them to descend into the great terror, the reign of Napoleon, and ultimately to the restoration of the monarchy. So the point being, when you deify reason, when you deify anything other than God, you're going to be in for trouble. Lack of rest is a curse. Now, those of you who struggle with insomnia, and sometimes my wife does, uh, feel the burden of that. And in your Bibles, hell is described in addition to being a place of torment and pain, as a place of continual unrest. And when we come to Christ in faith and repentance, we're given the first fruits of the eternal rest that is ours in this inheritance. If you go home and read Ephesians 1, it speaks of this inheritance, this huge basketful of gifts that are believers to have in Christ. And one of those things is rest. So truly, when a brother or sister in Christ passes away, we can say they are at rest in Christ. The Heidelberg Catechism, as most of you know, is one of the foundational documents of our denomination, the RCA. And in explaining the fourth commandment from the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment, which is the one that commands observing the Sabbath, the Catechism helpfully reads as follows. It says, what is God's will for you in the fourth commandment? First, that the gospel ministry and education for it be maintained, and that especially on the festive day of rest, I diligently attend the assembly of God's people to learn what God's word teaches, to participate in the sacraments, to pray to God publicly, and to bring Christian offerings for the poor. Second, that every day of my life I rest from my evil ways. Let the Lord work in me through his Spirit, and so begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. And I would submit to us if we want to know how should we mentally and spiritually comport ourselves or be disposed or inclined on the Sabbath, we can do no better than to go to Psalm 92. And Psalm 92 is the psalm that is a song for the Sabbath. So listen to this, and hopefully it resonates with you as this is how we should approach God on the Sabbath. It says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp. To the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know. The fool cannot understand this. That though the wicked sprout like grass, 
and all evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Amen. Second doctrine from uh, chapter 4, verse 15. The church of God has a standing, perpetual advantage in the union of our nature to the person of the Son of God, as he is our high priest. Robert Murray McShane was a Scottish pastor and writer from the 19th century, and he passed away at the very young age of 29, but his life and ministry left a huge imprint in Scotland and around the world. And I have his biography and some of his writings here. It's called The Memoir and Remains of Robert Murray McShane. And listen to what, uh, for those of you who know Spurgeon, the eminent preacher from the late 1800s in England, who had one of the most successful ministries you could have by any measure. Listen to what he says. He says, this is one of the best and most profitable volumes ever published. The memoir of such a man ought surely to be in the hands of every Christian and certainly every preacher of the gospel. And so his, McShane's short 29 years were compacted with gospel fruit, gospel ministry, and an inordinate love and affection for his savior. So I want to read you what he says about Jesus as our high priest, and hopefully you'll be encouraged here. And you're gonna hear the word sucker several times, and that means, if you're not familiar with it, assistance and support in times of distress. All right, we have a merciful and faithful high priest. He suffered being tempted, just that he might succor them that are tempted. The high priest of old not only offered sacrifice at the altar, his work was not done when the lamb was consumed. He was to be a father to Israel. He carried all their names graven over his heart. He went in and prayed for them within the veil. He came out and blessed the people, saying, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee, etc. So it is with the Lord Jesus. His work was not all done on Calvary. He, he that died for our sins lives to pray for us, to help in every time of need. He is still man on the right hand of God. He is still God, and therefore, by reason of his divinity, is present here this day as much as any of us. He knows your every sorrow, trial, difficulty, every half-breathed sigh he hears and brings in notice thereof to his human heart at the right hand of God. His human heart is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It pleads for you, thinks on you, plans deliverance for you. Dear tempted brethren, go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help you in your time of need. Are you bereaved of one you loved? Go and tell Jesus, Spread out your sorrows at his feet. He knows them all, feels for you in them all. He is a merciful high priest. He is faithful too, never a wanting in the hour of need. He is able to succor you by his word, by his spirit, by his providence. He gave you all the comfort you had by your friends. 
He can give it you without them. He has taken away the stream that you may go to the fountain. Are you suffering in body? Go to this high priest. He is intimately acquainted with all your diseases. He has felt that very pain. Remember how, when they brought to him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, he looked up to heaven and sighed and said, Be opened. He sighed over his misery, so he sighs over you. He is able to give you deliverance, or patience to bear it, or improvement by it. Are you sore tempted in soul, put into trying circumstances, so that you know not what to do? Look up. He is able to comfort you. If he had been on earth, would you not have gone to him? Would you not have kneeled and said, Lord, help me? Does it make any difference that he is at the right hand of God? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? He is our wonderful high priest. Doctrine from chapter 5, verse 9. All that befell the Lord Christ, all that he did or suffered, was necessary to this end or purpose that he might be the cause of eternal salvation to believers. Now this may seem an obvious point, but there's many individuals in the history of our faith that have screwed this point up. Even um, some that would be on the uh, pantheon of evangelicalism, like Charles Finney has screwed that up. In fact, for those of you uh, who are not familiar with Finney's theology, which is sorely lacking, B.B. Warfield from Princeton once somewhat hilariously observed that if God were removed altogether from Finney's theology, there would be no essential change in its character. So in his critique of Finney, R.C. Sproul tells us that Finney viewed the suffering and atonement of Christ for sin as merely something that spurs us on to acts of virtue and prevents or deters us from other sin. But in Finney's theology, it's not salvific. And that's a serious and substantial error. As C.S. Lewis said, it was not for societies or states that Christ died, but for man. And here we might add that it was not for abstractions or for purposes of being an exemplar that Christ died either. He lived and died and rose infallibly to secure the salvation of all who believe in him. And here John Owen drives the point home. He says, Some suppose that Christ was and is the author of salvation unto us only by showing, teaching, declaring the will of God and the way of faith and obedience whereby we may be saved. But why then was he consecrated in the way before described? Why did it become God to make him perfect through sufferings? Why was he bruised and put to grief? For what cause was he reduced unto the state and condition described in the verse foregoing? Certainly such men have low thoughts of sin and its guilt, of the law and its curse, of the holiness and righteousness of God, of his love to Jesus Christ, yea, and of his wisdom, who supposed that the salvation of sinners could be obtained without the price and merit of all that he did and suffered, or that God would have so dealt with his only son, might it any other ways have been attained. In other words, the point that he's making is that they're, they're, the design of salvation, the plan of redemption, was fully encompassed in God's mind, and there was no waste, there was no extra. Everything that he wanted Christ to accomplish was accomplished. And it wasn't accomplished for purposes of he, him being a good example and say, here guys, try this. This is how you get to God. No, he himself made satisfaction literally for our sins. He literally made it possible for us to be reconciled to God again. So that's important for us to understand. And unfortunately, some in the past, like Finney and others, 
have gotten that wrong and say, well, he was a good example. And by the way, Finney would say where Adam screwed up is that Adam was a bad example. No, that was a more critical error than being a bad example. That was the fall of the human race. Doctrine derived from chapter 5, verse 11. There is a glorious light and evidence in all divine truths, but by reason of our darkness and weakness, we are not always able to comprehend them. And here, Owen's going to get into our business a little bit here. He says, some hear divine truths, especially in the context of preaching, to satisfy their convictions, some their curiosity and inquiry after notions, some to please themselves, some out of custom, some for company, and many know not why, or for no purpose at all. It is no wonder if such persons then be slothful in and unprofitable under hearing. Wherefore, in order to have a right discharge of this duty, it is required of us that we consider our condition or stature in Christ. Pause there for just a second. So if you remember one line alone from this sermon, think, how am I supposed to come into the sanctuary on Sunday? Come considering your condition or stature in Christ. Everything else will follow from that. If you don't do that, and for the litany of reasons he gives above, in essence he's saying, look, some people come to church because it's our custom. Some come, some come, it's the thing to do. Well, my family goes, so I go. And I go. But he's challenging us to say, no, this is how you ought to enter into the presence of the Lord. He says, how short we come of that measure in faith, knowledge, light, and love, which we hope to attain to when we don't come in the right disposition. To supply us with this growth and increase, the preaching of the word is appointed of God as food for our souls. So here, how ought we to position ourselves mentally and spiritually before the preaching of the word? Distractedly? Irreverently? No. And here I put what Owen helps us out with uh, on the screen. To approach the hearing and the preaching of the word, we ought to do it with prayer, meditation, and a due reverence and regard to the authority and presence of God, with faith exercised on his promises. He assumes, of course, that the preacher is doing that. This isn't, this isn't Ben saying, hey, you guys ought to come in the room with this attitude. First, Owen would say, well, first you, Ben, have to do that. Then, the expectation of the congregation is that way. Now, we regularly fail at that. I regularly fail at that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't aim for that. In Doctrine from... Chapter 5, verse 14, we just talked about food a second ago in listening to Owen. Whereas the word is food, it is evident that it will not profit our souls until it be eaten and digested. Owen says it's, it's evidence of a thriving and healthy state of soul to have an appetite for the deepest mysteries of the gospel or most solid doctrines of truth, and to be able to profitably digest them. This is the substance of the character which the apostle here gives of such persons. And he blames these Hebrews that such they were not. And therefore such character we ought all to be who live under circumstances and advantages like theirs. And we even have way more advantages than Owen was talking about 350 years ago. You all have a little device, most of you, in front of you, which has an embarrassment of riches on it, scripturally, doctrinally, right? He says, this is the property of a thriving soul, of a proficient student in the school of Christ. He is naturally inclined to desire the declaration of the most weighty and substantial truths of the gospel. In them is he delighted, and by them is he profited. Whereas, if you take others beyond milk, or first principles, ordinarily they are at a loss, and very little benefited by any provision you can make for them. Now one of the good things about teaching youth, 
is that I know going into it that they need milk. I call it youth meeting, M-E-A-T, because that's what we're aiming for. But I know that I'm dealing with milk. I, I, ch I channeled uh, last week, my kids might have um, caught on to this, but uh, there was kind of an, a hilarious um, episode when I was in high school, a senior year, in a pep band rehearsal, and our um, band teacher stops us in the middle of a rehearsal, and he just hangs his head, and he's like, you guys stink so bad. <laughs> and we were all like, I know, we do. It's, we're really horrible. None of us disagreed. We were like, yeah, you're right, we, we stink. And last week I was humorously telling the kids as I was teaching them and telling them, someday you're gonna pray with your families. Someday you need to pray with your spouse. Now right now, you all stink at prayer, but I'm gonna help you get better at it. Right now you're on the milk and you stink at it, but together we're gonna to work on it. And I don't think they resented that. I think they were, they were probably like me in high school. Yeah, he's right, we, we, we stink at it. So remember last week I mentioned that right theology always ought to, ought to lead to right doxology. And Owen's gonna ratify that again by sharing with us the results of the appetite for and the consumption of the things of God. He says, we ought to upon the declaration and discovery of any deep important mysteries of the gospel, be greatly taken up with a holy admiration and reverence of God, whose these things are. So our apostle, the apostle Paul, having in the ninth, 10th and 11th chapters of his epistle to the Romans, treated of the deep mysteries of electing grace and the effects of it, he closes his whole discourse in an admiration of God and an ascription of glory unto him. Now let's look at that and see what uh, Owen is talking about. So grab the Bibles in front of you if you would. And uh, turn to page, it's on 947 if you want to grab the Bible under your um, chair. It's, I don't believe this is going to be on the screen. So Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. And listen to what he says. So Owen is saying, after all this teaching, all this depth, Paul gives us the example of how to respond now that you know these things and embrace these things. And here we hear the, the heart of Paul, Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen, Paul says. And so that's what I mean by right theology leads to right doxology. If your theology and your understanding of Scripture is leading you to a cold, dead heart, then something's wrong. You're doing something wrong. Or you're not approaching Scripture uh, with the open eyes and open heart that you ought to. Two days before his death on August 19, 1982, Loyal Davis, who had saved the letter from his son-in-law, Ronnie, sought out a hospital chaplain to pray with him. The hardened shell of atheism had been cracked open by Reagan's letter and the eminence of his own mortality. Nancy Reagan reported that her father did indeed turn to God at the end of his life. So Reagan's letter was effective. What about this letter to the Hebrew Christians that we're going through? Was it effective? Is it effective? Now, of course, as it's the living word of God, I believe this letter is effective. It seems to me that an encounter with scripture usually results in one of three things. We're either drawn closer to God, or secondly, we're drawn to God for the first time, or third, we get hardened in our stubborn unbelief. 
Usually it's one of those three things. But I pray that those of you who are believers experience yourself being drawn closer to God as we dig into these things. For any of you who are unsure or you're adrift from God and you feel that or you know that, I want you to consider this final admonition from McShane. He says, if Christ is now visiting your soul, do not trifle with him. Remember, he died at age 29. He knows of what he speaks. Some persons, when Christ begins to knock at the door of their heart, put him off from time to time. They trifle with their convictions. They say, I'm too young yet. Let me taste a little more pleasure in the world. Youth is the time for mirth. Another time, I will open the door. Some say, I am too busy. I have to provide for my family. When I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. Some say, I am strong and healthy. I hope I have many years to live. When sickness comes, then I will open the door. Consider that Christ may not come again. He is knocking now. Let him in. Another day he may pass by your door. You cannot command convictions of sin to come when you like. Christ is entirely sovereign in saving souls. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, even as we've skimmed the meat of these two chapters of your word, I pray that you would bring it home to us, that it would go deep inside of us, that there would be seeds of truth and growth and good works that bloom out of what we've heard, that bloom out of your word. We thank you and really struggle to find the words to praise you and adore you for the fact that you are our high priest and that unlike the Old Testament tabernacle when the high priest could only enter the presence of God once a year you sit as McShane said at the right hand of the Father interceding for us all day every day this mysterious work and power of intercession that you have is beyond our understanding but we know you do it you've told us that you're doing it you've told us to cast our cares and our burdens on you and so Lord we trust that we can do that this church May it be pleasing to you, not only in what we believe, but in our fruit of the Spirit towards each other, that we would have right belief, that we would have right actions, that we would have right interactions, and that we would enter your presence with some weak but still accurate understanding of your transcendence your holiness God help us to soberly hear the warnings that the writer of the Hebrews writes to the Hebrew Christians it says don't be like the hard-hearted Israelites so many of whom were lost and were hardened in their unbelief even when traveling in the wilderness in the manifest presence of God. They did not believe and their hearts were hardened. God, let that not be true of us. Let the embarrassment of riches of your word, of the many evidences we see with our own eyes and our own minds that make your power and goodness and reality so abundantly clear, let those be fresh and real to us. As we carry out the week's activities and we administer what you've given us to administer with tithes and offerings. Be with us this week in the gatherings that happen here, in the gatherings that happen outside of here, 
that you would be blessed and honored by what goes on, by what's discussed, and by hearts that are changed. Now be with us as we continue to worship, that our hearts might be drawn close to you, our great high priest, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.